Hello and welcome back to Gen Chem with Dr. J. I'm Dr. Janita Pritchett and on this channel we cover all things Gen Chem related. On this video we'll be exploring vapor pressure and how it impacts things like the boiling point. Let's get started. So in the previous video, we learned about uh, the evaporation process and how we are able to take liquid molecules and get them into the vapor phase. Well, as you may remember, once you have things in the vapor phase, those molecules are bouncing around, they're in motion. Now, as they are, are bouncing around, every time they strike the surface or the container that they're in, they're generating a pressure associated with them. That pressure that we um, are able to measure is what we call the vapor pressure of a substance. All right, so let's think about it. What's gonna impact the vapor pressure when it comes to these intermolecular forces? Well, if we have very weak intermolecular forces, things that aren't really that tightly attracted to each other, they get in the vapor phase a lot quicker. Things that are in the vapor phase a lot quicker will start bounce around, generate that vapor pressure. So your take home message is that the weaker the attractive forces are in a substance, the higher the vapor pressure will be. And that's because these are more volatile substances that you're dealing with. Now, as we mentioned before, there is this dynamic equilibrium that exists between the, 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 the molecules as we're going from evaporating to condensing and vice versa. And any changes that occur within the, um, the container that it's in is gonna impact it. So if I shift um, to you know, create a, a larger space, that's gonna impact how much vapor is created. And if I condense it down to where now I have lesser space, that's gonna impact it. But regardless of what's happening, because we have this dynamic equilibrium, the vapor, the, um, the uh, equilibrium process will actually reestablish itself where the rates will end up being um, consistent with one another. And then again, the vapor pressure would reset itself and be consistent as it was before. And so you can see in this picture representation here where we're, we're changing the space that's in the container, how increasing the space increases that vaporization process, Decreasing the space increases the condensation process, but eventually those, mole those molecules um, will reestablish that equilibrium. Okay. And so um, the thing we just want to remember when we have a system that's in dynamic equilibrium, it's going to respond to the changes that are induced. And so the system will shift its position to relieve or reduce any of these effects um, associated with the change. All right, now, so one thing we can uh, monitor is how is vapor pressure impacted by the temperature? Well, we know if we increase the temperature that's pumping more energy in, more energy in means more vapor created. And so what we should see as we increase the temperature, the vapor pressure of a substance would increase. And really very small changes in that temperature will have very big differences in the vapor pressure that we're monitoring. And again, we can make some, some predictions about the strength of intermolecular forces if we look at things like your vapor pressure curve. Now, a vapor pressure curve is just simply a plot of your temperature on the X and your vapor pressure of a substance on the Y. But we can predict um, you know, things about the intermolecular forces based on what we're seeing here. So it's hard to tell, but the, the, the substance that is in this kind of dark blue, that very first top line that we see that's coming in at 200 uh, millimeters of mercury at zero degrees Celsius. Well, notice at zero degrees, no, you know, not very low temperature, we already have vapor pressure created. Versus for that more royal blue color, notice it's at zero. We don't start seeing significant increases until we add that temperature, get it up higher. So what information can we deduce from that? Well, remember, things that have higher vapor pressures tend to have weaker intermolecular forces. And, and knowing what these substances are, where we're looking at ether versus the titanium four chloride, that what we know is depicted on this picture. The thing with the stronger intermolecular forces, that titanium chloride, titanium four chloride, its vapor pressure is very low until we start adding more and more temperature. All right. Um, we can also determine um, for water, like what the normal boiling point is. That boiling point is whenever the atmospheric pressure is equivalent to the vapor pressure. And so for water, that boiling point is at 100 degrees. Um, and for, um, for ethanol, we can see um, at 500 millimeters mercury, we'll have boiling occurring at 68.1 degrees. All right, so based off what we know, which of the following of these substances would we say is most volatile? So remember, volatile means that it can get in the gas phase very quickly. And so if we're saying it can get in the gas phase very quickly, then we're looking at something with weak intermolecular forces, would have a high vapor pressure at low temperatures. And so that would be our ether. 
which of these would have the strongest intermolecular forces? Well, again, we're looking for well, which one requires the most temperature, high increase in temperature to get things in the vapor phase. And that would be our titanium four chloride. And, and we should know that. That's the only ionic compound here. And so even if we didn't have the vapor phase, vapor curve information, we could still make that type of prediction, but it's just um, we're, we're using the picture to help support that. All right. Um, now, I briefly touched on this boiling point um, a few slides ago, but just remember that when the temperature of a liquid reaches the point where the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure, that's when you start seeing the bubbling occurring. And it's not just on the surface. You'll see it like sometimes at the bottom of a, of a kettle or whatever you're using. So that process is known as your boiling process. And so that's when your vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure. So if you've ever traveled or, or, or cooked in different places, you know that boiling point can shift a bit based on the atmospheric pressure. Um, when we're dealing with something that's at sea level, yeah, our water boils at 100 degrees. But if we went to somewhere like Mount Everest, which was super high in the air, and you know there's a, a, a definite decrease in the atmospheric pressure, but look what happens to our boiling point. It also decreases. And you can imagine if we were somewhere under sea or below sea level, like maybe New Orleans, that the boiling point should increase a bit because that external pressure is greater. Okay. And so we could also look at um, these vapor pressure charts and make a prediction about which would have the highest boiling point. And so again, boiling point at normal atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And so the one that has the highest would be our titanium chloride. Um, coming in at about mm, 140 or so, okay? So I hope this information helped you guys understand vapor pressure and how it impacts things like the boiling point and even how to read vapor pressure curve um, plots. Make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe and let me know what other videos you'd like to see. See you guys in future videos. Have a great day. Talk to you later.